questions in just a heads up. So it'll be good to have some time for Q and A. Cool, we'll try and do that. No problem. Very five past one. Sorry, uh, five two will be starting now. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. So welcome back, everybody. We have Mark Buckley here from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Nicely tied in after Hannah's uh, Hannah's uh, previous uh, talk on circular design and fashion. And we're going to apply now or learn more from Mark on how to apply circular design principles in your own business. And Mark, he is a strategic design manager at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. He's combining his creative experience across research, product, and service design innovation. Mark uses design as the foundation to engage and equip creatives in their network to design for a circular economy. He has led the development of tools and resources that empower organizations to rethink their packaging portfolios through radical upstream innovation aligned with circular economy principles. Thanks, Mark, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Priya. It's great to join you this afternoon. So yes, this session is going to be all about the circular economy, circular design, and how we can practice it in our work. In this 20 minutes, I'm going to try and give a quick overview of the basics of what circular design is, and then give you a sneak peek at some of our resources. If you've got any questions or comments um, throughout the session, drop them in the chat, and my colleague Joe will help answer them, or we'll pick them up at the end. Okay, let's dive in. We live in a linear economy. It's hugely wasteful, and in some places, it's getting faster. For example, in just the last 15 years, clothing production has doubled, but usage has dropped by 40%. And the common response can often be, let's use less, be more efficient and recycle more. But we know this won't solve the problem in the long run, as they, this just treats the symptoms rather than the root cause. We need a fundamental rethink, a redesign to an imagined economy that can work in the longer term. And that's the idea of a circular economy based on three core principles where we eliminate waste and pollution, we circulate products and materials to keep them at their highest value, and finally we regenerate nature. So instead of continuously degrading nature, we can rebuild soil health, biodiversity, and return biological materials to the earth to begin to emulate natural cycles. Essentially, there's no waste in nature, and we can aim to create a system where we put more back than we take out. So that's the three principles of the circular economy. And clearly, design is fundamental to those principles, from the clothes we wear, to the buildings we live in, to the systems that deliver us food and mobility. Everything has been designed. And decisions made in the design stage set in motion how that product is used and whether it stays in our economy, providing value to us all, or if it's lost as waste. Now, not everyone is a designer, but quite a few people are. And even if they don't call themselves one, we estimate that designers and creatives represent about 5% of the global workforce. And it's this 5% that will play a crucial role over the next decades in designing the world we live in. That's lots of people on this webinar today. It will be people who design products or services or systems, product designers, digital designers, architects, urban planners, people working in startups or policy or business leaders. And our ambition at the foundation is to empower those 5% and make designing for the circular economy, the new normal. And when we say circular design, it's really just designing for a circular economy. And the easiest way to think about what circular design is, is a combination of three things. It's designing with the three principles of a circular economy in mind, um, and the three I've just described, and doing that while at all stages, understanding at different levels, the systems that you're designing for and with and within. And for a long time, we've known that understanding systems is key to address global challenges. And luckily it's actually a process which designers are especially familiar with and especially good at. And of course, 
Circle of Design is about design. It's an active practice. It's hands-on. It's about doing and iterating and creating something positive. So that's what circular economy is and what circular design is. How do we put it into practice? And we've been speaking to lots of designers over our work over the recent years. And we think there's three kind of key actions beyond specific strategies, you know, circular design strategies that are kind of the superpowers of doing circular design. And the first one is about zooming in and out to different lenses of when we're designing. So thinking about, say, a user and diving into their needs, but then also zooming out to understand the impacts on wider society. Think about a single material choice, but then zooming out to think about the wider ecological systems that that affects. And then think about a single purchase or a single value exchange, and then zoom out to think about the bigger economic systems and economies that affects too. So zooming in and out is really important, then also the scope of what we're designing and the value we're looking to create is a really important action within circular design. So thinking not just at a product level, but the business models and the system conditions, because sometimes we need to widen the scope of what we're designing in order to create a circular outcome. You might need to collaborate with a competitor or you might need to redesign policy or financial mechanisms or even education to enable that new thing you're designing or that new process or that new service to be able to thrive and distribute value in a future world. That's what we mean by widening the scope. And then finally, feedback. Circular design isn't an exact science and we're in a moment of transition where the linear economy and the circular economy are coexisting. So there naturally be tensions between incentives and structures and behaviors in the old model and those of the new model and designing in feedback and information is the only way we can ensure that we continually move in the right direction so they're the three actions that we think are really key we'd be interested to hear in the, in the chat what you think of those actions we've got a, a recent article we've um, published that explore those a little bit more that my colleague Joe will drop into the chat but that's kind of a bit of theory. So let's apply that to um, some sectors. And I can also then point to some kind of practical resources to put those into action. And at the foundation, we have a focus in design in plastics, fashion, and food. So let's start with fashion. And the best place to start is our new book, Circular Design for Fashion. It's designed for creatives working in the fashion industry. And while we were seeing the term circular more commonly used in this sector, there was no kind of common holistic understanding of what it means to design for circularity in the fashion industry. And that's what this book is for. It presents a new mindset, offering a creative lens through which to develop new products and services that address some of the industry's biggest challenges. It's a beautiful book. It provides insight from more than 80 early practitioners of circular design. It's won a number of design awards recently, and we would love to see this becoming a well-thumbed reference in design studios and agencies across the world. So if you'd like to learn more about the book, see some of the um, frameworks in there to help designers and get your hands on a copy, go to the link um, in the chat that um, Joe will drop in and um, you can find all the places you can buy the book online or in store. So that's fashion, and then let's move to an even faster moving sector, and one that also relies on our landscape, and that is food. What if our food could build biodiversity? And what if growing food could help tackle climate change? That's what we asked in our latest design-led publication, because today just four crops produce, provide 60% of the world's calories. So what we grow and how we grow it is hugely extractive in today's world. And it also dictates what our landscape looks like. 
So in the big food redesign, we outline how rather than bending nature to produce food, food can be designed for nature to thrive. And that also then shifts our landscape from the conventional, which we see on the left-hand side of this image, to rich, diverse landscapes full of biodiversity on the right. And in that insight piece, we show what that vision could look like through speculative design, like a climate crunch here in the top right corner, which is a protein packed cereal. It's a blend of regeneratively grown wheat and peas, which are grown together in the fields. And there's other examples here you can find on our website. And I won't go into the detail in this kind of quick teaser, um, but in the publication, there's this framework to, to guide designers on how we can redesign product portfolios for nature, positive outcomes. It's a really useful tool to guide decision making. So if you're working in this sector, I'd encourage you to go and check out this report. And then finally, but not least, almost all our food and most of the products we buy come in packaging. And as we know, a lot of that is wrapped in plastic, something that's used for a moment, but lasts a lifetime. The way we package things needs an urgent redesign. And we know that we won't fix plastic pollution with just more collection and more recycling. It's a design challenge. So around two years ago, we launched Upstream Innovation, a guide to packaging solutions. And we launched this guide with tools and resources to help people working in this sector get these insights into action. So our last few minutes, I'll give you a quick overview of the key insights in this guide, and I can walk you through a workshop tool we've created that accompanies it. Before we dive in, it'd be helpful to find out from people in the chat how familiar you are with our work um, on packaging and upstream innovation. A, B, C, or D, you can drop it in the chat. Cool, oh, that's good to see. Great, bit of a mix, that's good to see. Um, very briefly, up through innovation is really, rather than working at how to deal with a pile of waste, we work out how to prevent it from being created in the first place. It's about rethinking the design stage of a product or material. And to move beyond kind of incremental package improvements to fundamentally rethinking how to deliver products and services to a user, we need a mindset shift where we think about not just the packaging design, but thinking about the product and the business model at the same time. And once we've got that mindset in place, it can then be applied through three key circular economy strategies. So elimination, reuse, and material circulation and crucially in that order. So let's dive into elimination, some quick examples. It can be done directly like Tesco have here by removing the plastic film wrapping from around their cans. And they just had to change the design of the experience in store where you get those multi by two deals at the checkout. Sometimes you need a bit of innovation. Um, and here Carlsberg use glue dots to hold the cans together to eliminate the needs for the plastic rings. And finally, Lush, that's changed not just the packaging, but also the product. So they sell shampoo as a bar, which means there's no need for a bottle. But of course, there they need to be able to communicate to the customers. So they're using a product recognition tool to give customers more information, ingredients, and tips on how to use their products that they could ever, more than they could ever fit onto a label. So that's just a couple of examples of uh, elimination. And then in the guide, there's lots of examples about reusable packaging and then packaging that's designed to circulate. But just for the last one minute, I will just share with you where you can find a tool to put some of this into action. So on our website, um, if you go to uh, our upstream innovation section and go to get started, there is a Miro workshop tool here. It's held on the Miroverse. Um, and if you click use template, once you've made a Miro account, you can then land in a frame that looks a little bit like this. 
And within this um, workshop tool, it's designed to be a three hour workshop. You can run with sort of 10 to 20 people and apply the principles of the guide to a packaging brief. So in here, there's some example instructions how to use Miro. There's all the links to the guide and the slide deck that's open source that I use today. A overview of the strategies in the guide. And then the heart of the workshop tool is these strategy cards that each one represents a way um, to rethink the packaging, the product, or the business model. And to run this workshop, all you need to do is choose one of the strategies, create a how might we question, something to focus your ideation, and then pick some strategy cards to help you answer that question. Each one's linked to a case study, you ideate, and there's some uh, prioritization tools at the bottom of the tool. So wow. we've got our questions. That's amazing, Mark. This is like gold dust. I mean, given the theme of action, people can get cracking on the workshop immediately with all these resources on Miro and the strategy cards. Thank you so much. There are definitely some questions both in the Q&A and the chat. I'll take the one from the Q&A first. There's one from Faye. My interest is in the data that needs to be collected and shared between organizations to enable conclusions to be drawn on the global issues. Are there any ideas and experience on this? Um, oh, I guess it, uh, we launched um, last week our global commitment progress report. So that's where um, hundreds of brands um, producing plastic packaging are reporting to the foundation and to the United Nations how much plastic they're producing each year. And we're reporting on their progress against 2025 targets. So there you can see what people are doing and some of the examples where they're finding ways to eliminate packaging or reuse their packaging. So for plastics, there's definitely um, lots of data being shared. Great. Um, Paul Sfafan, Paul saying, great talk, thank you. It seems unlikely that these types of approaches hadn't occurred to designers in the past. From your experience, Mark, what are the big problems we face in transitioning to a more circular economy? And on the flip side, what are the big drivers current, currently as you see? Thank you. Oh, good, big question. Um, what the big problems we face in transitioning to a more circular economy is that joined up system thinking. So many of the um, the solutions we need to see, especially in, in reusable packaging, need a systems approach. And that means lots of companies collaborating, working together to make a system that doesn't exist today. And it won't be, it'll be hard for them to do it alone, but it could be a profitable, successful system if they do it in, in collaboration. Um, so it's that kind of open mindset to creating a, an ecosystem together that I think we need to see more of. There's one from Richard Terry here. Can you say anything of your work with the construction industry, infrastructure, and buildings? I know there's quite a few building folks on the on the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't covered um, built environment today, but there is a section on our website that has um, some information. It's mainly linked to our work in climate, looking at the impact of steel, cement, aluminium, um, because essentially, if uh, fifty five percent of getting to net zero can be sold through energy efficiency and the way we produce energy. The other half is how we make products and, and create food. Um, and so the only way we can reach net zero is by looking at both the, the materials economy and our energy system. Um, so I think lots of our built environment work um, and the design element you can find on our website um, under our climate section. Brilliant, thank you. And then Pernilla here is asking, what is, your, uh, what is, what is it from your experience, the key motivator for these businesses that have shifted to being more circular? Lots of, in the upstream innovation guys, particularly on plastics, there's lots of reasons as to why we think upstream innovation is an exciting opportunity for business. It can be a way to meet targets, meet climate goals. Reuse, for example, can be a way to collect more information from customers, build brand loyalty. There's a, a whole host of reasons um, in the guide and also on our design section website about why we think circular design is, a, is an exciting opportunity. We have one here from Beatrice who's saying, I think ownership is one of the concepts that needs to be rethought if we want to be sustainable in the long term. Are you looking at new forms of ownership within the circular economy? Economy. What is your take on this? Another big, big question. Uh, so at, kind of at the, the, the heart of the circular economy idea, uh, and there's lots of schools of, of thought on this, but the idea of access to, to 
um, the use of a, of a product over ownership of products is a kind of a key key component of that. Um, so absolutely, yeah. The questioning who owns what uh, is yeah is in a big part of the the idea. And Camilla on Q and A asks, have you thought about this being usable in developing world where they don't have packet stuff? So, is it repeat the question again? Have you thought about this being usable in the developing world where they don't have packet stuff, et cetera? Okay, I, I think if the questions if the question is referring to the the tools and the information, then, then absolutely, we have we have examples and case studies in our in our library um, from all across the world, and um, yeah, the, the the principles of a circular economy one need to be locally relevant and understood with the local environment. The principles um, can, can yeah can be applied around the world, and we have lots to learn from some in other geographies and other places where there's ways in which products are sold and reused that don't require packaging that we can um, we can learn from here too. I think Camilla's also asking for your contact to share. Either you or Joe can share with Camilla. She works at the World Global Pavilion developing or delivering um, SDG cities. And then this is a really interesting one from Sebastian Thorpe. Is there any policy analysis we can point to in the UK that is driving this move to circular economy in different industries? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I say at a global level, we're excited to see that there's a, a UN treaty being negotiated, um, a plastics treaty. And so at a, at a global level, there's lots of um, focus now on, on what, what's the role of policy in, in fixing plastic pollution. Um, at the UK level, that's yeah, that's not something I have information on today, but I'm sure um, we can we can get that to you. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. And we're nearly out of time, so just squeeze in a last question from Gulia. What is the main obstacle to stakeholders' alignment in the circular design process? The main problem to yeah, in terms of alignment, yeah, I guess alignment. In all those examples, we we. Um, shared today the, 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 that mindset shift is um, is the key thing. Once the, the mindset shifts there, then it's a, a case of align, alignment of, of principles and goals towards something uh, to you know, towards a, a common outcome. But it's that mindset shift that I think we need to see first. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. This is so inspiring. Thanks, Joe, for sharing the links. And there are some links also Joe's just put in in the chat. I hope you guys managed to grab the Miro links. All of this will be recorded. And uh, Mark's given us also the strategy cards to so get cracking on your next workshop. And we'll take your leave now and move to the next uh, webinar. And you can contact Mark and Joe both on the links that they have shared here. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Thank you, Priya. Catch you online. Bye.